नमस्ते हेलो रॉबिन वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशंस सो नाइस ऑफ यू टू मेक द टाइम सो व्हाट इज योर अर्लीएस्ट मेमोरी ऑफ और रिकॉलेक्शन ऑफ नॉन वायलेंस इन एनी फॉर्म इधर एज अ कांसेप्ट और एज एन एक्सपीरियंस समथिंग दैट हैपेंड इन योर लाइफ I think my earliest recollection actually has to do with violence which led me to think about nonviolence when I was 12 I was at summer camp <clears throat> and we had a young girl with us in our cabin and she had other abilities um other other mental capacities than we did and nobody sat us down to explain to us the differences that she experienced and we as a group of girls were very mean to her and we taunted her we, we did not understand her needs um and even to this day that experience what i participated in has led me to think a lot about youth and students and young people and how they are they can be led down that path of of violence but that we can change that path and direct them to the one of nonviolence um and then i had found in my parents house a newspaper picture that i had cut out when i was probably about uh 14 or 13 and it was a photograph of Martin Luther King and I don't remember anybody teaching me about Martin Luther King or or why I was possessed to cut this picture out but I feel like it was meant to be and it was part of what led me down the path and brought me to the living the life as a practitioner of Kingian nonviolence Mm. did you actively and consciously go looking to be a trainer in kingian nonviolence or did it happen by some mm, circumstantial quirk it was actually kismet i think um i was teaching i i was a public school educator i just retired in 2019 i had a 28 year career and i taught mostly 5th grade which are 10 and 11 year old students i taught all subjects and i was also this year that i'm talking about in 2001 teaching with the local police department we were team teaching so it would be myself and a police officer teaching the students about how to keep our communities safe and the police captain brought a guest in one day and i did not know who the guest was but i found out that it was dr bernard lafayette junior who worked with dr martin luther king junior and and dr lafayette was in rhode island where i live he was just brought to our town as the director for the of the center for nonviolence and peace studies at the university of rhode island and the cap the police captain had brought him in to see oh like showing him that we're teaching youth about safety in their communities. So anyway, long story short, my students were very interested in who he was and oh my goodness, you worked with Dr. Martin Luther King, tell us about him, tell us about you. And Dr. Lafayette ended up coming to visit us once a week and teaching myself and my students about Dr. King's philosophy and strategies of nonviolence, which are now known as Kingian nonviolence. And so I guess the answer to your question was I wasn't expecting it but I wasn't surprised by it. I don't think there's anything that's that's, you know, coincidental coincidental. I think things happen for a reason. I think all along my way and my upbringing and my experiences led me to that day in 2001 where I met Dr. Lafayette and then um he one of my students asked him if he would take us to the places where Martin Luther King lived and worked which is very far away from Rhode Island it's in Atlanta Georgia where he was born and Dr. Lafayette said well you kids have to raise $20,000 which was a lot of money in 2001 it's a lot of money now 
And in three months, we raised $20,000. The community rallied around us and donated money. And we had potluck dinners and everything. And we took an airplane and we visited Atlanta, Georgia and Montgomery where the bus boycott happened. We went to Selma and marched over the bridge with Dr. Lafayette. We met all kinds of wonderful people. And when I came back from that experience, I self-reflected on my philosophy of teaching and how I am as a human being. And I realized that Kingian nonviolence is what was missing from my teaching practice. And so I wrote a curriculum for educators about how to teach Kingian nonviolence and started doing some teacher trainings. And that's that story. There's a lot of more pieces to it, but yeah, it was, it was, a remarkable experience and Dr. Lafayette is a wonderful mentor to, for me today and a friend and yeah. I owe a great deal to him. He is, he is an amazing, I've met him at a conference some years ago. Uh, before we get into the details of what you do, schools uh, for nonviolence or nonviolent schools campaign, can you uh, briefly share with uh, the people who will watch this, how you uh, define Kingian nonviolence? Uh, because I know that th there are specific insights there uh, which are very rich. So I'd like to hear them from you. Okay. So um, on April 4th, 1968, which was the day that Dr. King was assassinated in the early evening, Bernard Lafayette was with him in the morning. And Dr. King said to him, Bernard, we need to institutionalize and internationalize nonviolence. And those were the last words he spoke to Dr. Lafayette. And then when he found out that he was assassinated, he says that he never had time to mourn because Dr. King had given him this very important charge that we need to institutionalize and internationalize nonviolence. So Dr. Lafayette, along with a man named David Jensen wrote a leader's manual and started doing this training. So part of the training is learning about conflict. What is conflict? Um, what are the different levels of escalation of conflict, different types of conflict? And I think that's really important to understand before we get into the ideas of Kingian nonviolence. And then Kingian nonviolence has two foundational pillars. One are the six principles and one are the six steps to reconcile conflict. And so what I found in my 28 year career of teaching is that there are a lot of programs <clears throat> that are out there to teach students to be kind or to not bully, but they don't provide students with the reason why. Why should I forgive someone who has harmed me? Why should I not harm somebody else? And that's what the six principles of Kingian nonviolence do. They give us the why. So for example, Principle one is nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. And we teach students that what is courage? How do I find my courage? Can I learn about being more courageous? And that nonviolence is a way of life. It's not something we come in and out of. It's something we are. It's who we are. And then I'll just say one more. Principle two is the beloved community is the framework for the future. And so that's the goal if we're asking students to repair relationships after a conflict has occurred and they wanna know why, we, we refer back to that ideal of the beloved community, which is a place where everyone's included, conflict occurs, but people all have the six steps, these strategies to address conflict. Excellent. Can you just run us through the six steps uh, the six actions which uh, are core to this approach? Yes. So the first step is information gathering, which is really important because you can find that a conflict has actually been just a misunderstanding. So you find specific questions that you want to ask of all the people involved in the conflict. So as a teacher, that takes a little bit of time, but it's worth my time investment because students who are having conflicts are not listening to me when I'm teaching. They're worried about what's happening. So asking the right questions. And then step two is education, 
which I'm doing for myself when I'm asking questions, when I'm gathering information, I'm educating myself. But then when I get information, I can educate others with that. And then step three is personal commitment. So at this point, I say, this is a pretty big conflict. Am I personally committed to see this through? And people do different things for personal commitment. Some people meditate, some people pray, some people gather their friends and have a conversation and that, and that you stay personally committed for the duration. The goal is to negotiate a win-win solution. Um, oftentimes people give up things because they just want to get along and we encourage a collaborative win-win solution. Sometimes compromise is what works best for, for all the people involved and that's okay, but we don't, we don't encourage young people to give things up. You know, we have some students with personalities like that. No, no, it's okay. You can have it. You can have it. So we teach students to support their their stance with um, facts, gathering information, etc. If negotiation fails in a really big campaign, you go to a direct action. And the purpose of direct action is to get people back to the negotiation table. So ne direct action can be uncomfortable for people. And Dr. King taught us that that discomfort is what's important because people need to see the humanity in each other, that if you're harming me, there's it also harms you as well. And negotiating is in our best interest. And then the final goal, whether it's a small conflict or a large one, is reconciliation. And that's a process where you figure out a way to repair the relationship. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that you're going to be best friends with people. It's a, it's a civil relationship at best, moving towards an even better possibility. It does forgiveness play a role in, in all of this? That when Because in, in life, the reality is that sometimes we end up, maybe sometimes inadvertently, hurting other people. Um, so what is the role of forgiveness in this? And I know that that's a complicated question because nobody can ask another person to be forgiving. So how, right. do you, how do you handle that? So forgiveness is, is part of reconciliation. You seek forgiveness and justice. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and what we teach students is that there's a way for you to get to that place. So we give students a reconciliation plan that they actually fill in and then the adults at the school help them implement. And one of the, one of the parts of that plan is to acknowledge the truth. This is what I did. And how will you show that you're sorry? Not say you're sorry, but show you're sorry. So I've got to change my actions in a way that the other person is going to believe that I truly feel terrible about what I've done and I want things to be better. And that's a way to start that, that process of forgiveness to, for me as the responsible human being is to show that I've changed my ways. So I think forgiveness, yes, you're right. And you can't force people to forgive. We would never do that. But what we tell people is that we always leave the door open for the possibility. Uh, so how did this get translated into the program, the campaign that you run? Uh, schools for nonviolence or nonviolent schools? It's nonviolent schools, Rhode Island, because that's where I am. And our mission is to train every teacher in Rhode Island in the Kingian nonviolence philosophy and strategies so that they can teach their students. Because I found that for me, since 2001, I've been teaching my students, um, but I only had 20 22 students a year and I thought that's not a big enough impact so if I can teach teachers that's that's exponentially a better impact right um, and so uh, in 2017 a group of people who have been trained uh, with, as well as myself talked about this idea of the organization, which I'd been thinking about for a while. And I knew I was ending my career in a few years, so I overlapped a little bit. But Nonviolent Schools Rhode Island has been working 
um, <clears throat> in a lot of different schools in our state to do what I just said. We train teachers, we train school administrators, we've trained nurses, school nurses and librarians and art and the art teacher, the music teachers, support staff in how to address conflict because when we start our training, most of the educators say, I don't know how to address conflict or I ignore it or I'm afraid of it or I'm confrontational. And so we get them to that place of thinking of a better way, that there's a nonviolent way. So we hear those that terminology, fight or flight, but the third way is nonviolence. <laughs> do you get resistance from some of your participants? Because we do live in a world where uh, there is a view that violence is more natural to human beings. Yeah. So do you... Uh, get this as a resistance uh, from among your participants? And how do you deal with this, this idea that violence is uh, more basic to us as, as humans? Um, so we, what we do is we have educators volunteer to come to our training. So we, we um, conduct our trainings in a little bit of a different way. We ask for volunteers. We don't force people to come. We want people who are going to embrace the philosophy, practice the philosophy and the strategies, and then go back to their schools and sell it to the rest of the people. So when I was teaching in my second, I was in two different schools, but in my second school, I would talk about conflicts in my classroom with my colleagues, just like we do at lunch. And when I would share the way my students were addressing conflicts, my colleagues said, we want you to teach us what you're doing, whatever that is, we want to learn it. And so in, um, about seven years ago, I think it was, we start, I started doing after school trainings and teachers volunteered to come. And that first year I trained 40 staff, both of my administrators and all those folks I mentioned before. And we formed a nonviolence team and we transformed that school to be a practicing Kingian nonviolence school. And that's the model we use for Nonviolent Schools Rhode Island. Our organization uses that model, that there is a possibility that a public school, which is funded by taxpayer money, can be a practicing Kingian nonviolence school. Uh, what are some of the ways in which this uh, actually uh, changed or uh, affected students' lives and their behavior? In what ways did it actually manifest? So we, we, we created an action plan in my school and it was a three-year action plan. And year, in year two, one of our action steps was to educate the families because they're part of our community. So we created a beautiful pamphlet that was informational. So they had all of the the principles, the steps, and some other things about conflict. And we had parents saying that the kids were going home and using this language with their siblings and with their parents. And so we knew then that that was now inside of their souls. That's part of who they were. And once you teach someone about kinging and nonviolence, you can't take it away. It's in, it's in you. Yeah. Um, and I've had students from that first year that went on that trip with us in 2001. I've seen them, that's 20 years ago. I've seen them because some of them are still in town and they will say the most important thing they learned in their education was nonviolence. And that most of them, or at least many of those students are doing um, wonderful things for the community and for society as careers. Wow. And so, yeah. And so I think that um, that right there is the mo one of the most powerful things. Um, and then lastly, we've had um, a turnaround of students who are violent, who students who have used physical violence in school, and we re-educate them about the steps and the and the principles and we give them new strategies to try next time you're in this situation 
here's a strategy. And we go through this whole reteaching process and we had no repeat offenders the first year we instituted that. So good Wonderful. stuff. And can anyone do it? Uh, because, um, you know, one of the skepticisms that this kind of work faces from people in society at large is that, oh, it can only happen when you have an extraordinary and committed person like Robin or like Charlie or like Bernard Lafayette, you know, in a leadership role, ordinary people can't do this. So how would you respond to that? Um, what we tell the teachers in our training <clears throat> is that the training is for them. It's not for their students. It's not to change the parents or an administrator. It's to change yourself. And, and the, the only person we can change is ourself. We can, we can show by example, we can train and teach, um, and we can hope that that impacts other people. And I'm, I'm confident, I see it, that once somebody learns about Kingian nonviolence, it's a new way of life because principal yeah. one says it is a way of life, but it's a new way of life. It's, it's a way to look at not just conflict, but people in a different light. So yeah. someone who's been your adversary now becomes the person that you focus your agape love and attention on yeah. rather than to pull away from that person to see if I, if I, as Dr. King referred to agape in his writing Pilgrimage to Nonviolence, which is where he wrote about the six principles, he says that um, agape is unselfish love. It's, it's not expecting anything in return. It's not like I love my mom or I love my pet. It's loving another human being for their potential that who they can become. And I think particularly for teachers who often have students who are very challenging to think about that every time that student challenges me, I'm gonna think about agape and take a step back and understand that the student isn't trying to be naughty they just need extra love and attention. Mm -hmm. they're, they're doing those things for a, a reason. So if from this very um, re reaffirming and regenerative space, how do you deal with the random violence that still happens uh, so often in the US, you know, with the random shootings uh, where completely unknown people are, are, are killed by uh, a gunman. Um, how, how do you deal with that emotionally? I mean, firstly, as a person living in that society? Well, the first thing I picture is that person as a five, six, seven year old and wondering what happened in their life as they move forward? And could, could we have done something better or differently for that young child um, who has now grown up with so much anger and hatred in their life? Could we have um, taught them about Kingian nonviolence and showed them that despite what's happening in your home, perhaps you came from a violent home, that there's another way to live. Because oftentimes when students come from abusive homes, they come to school and teachers are teaching them content area because that's their job. But if we can teach them that there is an alternative life out there for them, that they don't have to, to, you know, maybe we can't change what's happening for them in the moment, but we can give them hope for a better future. I think that we would see less angry people with guns lashing out because that's what they're doing. You know, Martin Luther King said, violence is the language of the unheard. So we need to hear them we need to hear them at an earlier place. It's almost like what we tell our students who have um, been physically violent. We ask them to think at the point when you start to feel annoyed with somebody, that's when you can do, that's when your brain is able to make a plan and do it, use a strategy. Once you get past that point of annoyance, it's, it's almost too late now, you need help de-escalating, but you can de-escalate yourself at that point of annoyance. And I think for people with guns, 
they're well past that point and and are living in a completely pervasively violent state yeah but what you're saying i think with a great deal of conviction is that it need not be a permanent state it can yeah. be changed so is that what the non violence uh, summer institution does institute i think sorry non violence summer institute uh, which you've been involved in i think you've been a teacher there as well this is an annual event am i right yeah so the university of rhode island the center for non violence and peace studies had ho has hosted that up until the pandemic and then because it's um so many hours they they decreased it but nonviolent schools rhode island my organization hosts a annual summer institute for anybody who works in a school and this year we have people from other countries coming coming virtually <laughs> um, which is so exciting we have you know somebody from morocco and south korea and and um, I think Pakistan, all, all different places. So www.nonviolentschoolsri.org. <laughs> <No. laughs> Great. And so this whole, um, the whole gathering will happen over Zoom. It'll, the whole thing will be in August over Zoom. Yes. Yep. How and many days does it go on? So it, our typical training is 20 hours. So what we've done is we've reserved Tuesdays and, and Wednesdays in August from 9 a.m. to 11.45 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, which I think will fit in with people who are on the other side of the world. Yeah. Excellent. So are you in touch with Tara Setia at uh, Cal Poly Pomona? Because they have, uh, she has worked with teachers who are trying to include nonviolence in their curriculum. Uh, oh. Yeah, you, I, I'll connect you to her. Uh, okay, that would be email. wonderful. Yeah. yeah, because I was wondering if, you know, you, you, I'm sure that you and the center and, and also this, uh, the nonviolence uh, summer institute are preoccupied by how to grow this. Uh, how to take it well beyond Rhode Island. So are you in touch with networks that are trying to do that? Uh, and how do you visualize this work, say, over the next 10 years? So, yeah, I've, I've been interviewed by different organizations in this country, like Pache Bene and Campaign Nonviolence. Um, so the word is kind of getting out there that in the smallest state in our country of Rhode Island, there's really, really big things happening, bigger than anywhere else in the country as far as um, nonviolence education in schools. This is the place to be. And so over the next 10 years, I just envision our staff growing. We're presently training doing an intensive training right now. We just are finishing up so that we can grow our training staff um, and that we will, be, we will be present in many more schools in the state. And this, this organization can be replicated in other places. It's, I know there are nonviolent centers. There's Kingian nonviolent centers around the world but nobody's yeah. doing the school piece, which yeah. is essential. It is, that is the key. That's where we need to be. We need to be with the youngest of young, whoever, however old you are when you get to school, three, four, five years old. I have two granddaughters that are four years old and they already know that Mimi, that's what they call me, Mimi loves peace. They know what peace, peace, they say, I say, what is peace? And they say, being kind and being loved. It's, they're never too young. You know, yeah. I, I read them books about Martin Luther King. It's, it's really important to um, open up people's hearts and minds. And that will include the families as well. Mm -hmm. Does Gandhi, does Mahatma Gandhi feature in this whole universe as well? Yeah, so without Gandhi, there'd be no Dr. King, as we know. 
Dr. King, you know, was deeply entrenched in the work that Gandhi did. I've read, I've read about Gandhi so that I can educate myself as well. Um, and yeah, the work, our Kingian nonviolence comes from Mohandas Gandhi. There's no other way to say it. And so in my classroom, we always read books about Gandhi and I taught the students about Satyagraha and how it connects. We, we did a double Venn diagram about Dr. King and Gandhi and their differences and similarities. And so we do have um, our participants know that that is the root of Kingian nonviolence. Excellent. So in closing, uh, Robin, uh, what advice would you give to young people who may not have uh, the opportunity to, you know, directly and personally be part of this kind of exercise that you run. Uh, what are some of the inner strengths uh, that you would suggest? What are some of the maybe inner disciplines that you could, from your vast experience in this field, that you could recommend uh, that, uh, and I say this, uh, with the, with the, those young people in mind who uh, are intrigued by nonviolence they because they are they are repelled by violence but they feel daunted by how to do nonviolence they feel oh it must be so difficult it it's tempting but it it looks very hard to do so what can you suggest to them that they can do just wherever they are in any part of the world that's a great question. So I think sometimes people think they need to organize a march out on the streets to be a nonviolent practitioner, which is very far from the truth. And it's like I said before, start with yourself. So I would suggest researching, read about what Gandhi has done, read about Dr. King, read about Cesar Chavez, read about Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela. There's find find the collective commonality between the people who we know are the ones who have led the way. And once you've understood what nonviolence is, what, if it's Gandhian nonviolence, Kingian nonviolence, any, any of the forms of nonviolence, once you understand what it means, then you can start practicing it in your life. Because the, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what is nonviolence. So we need to educate people and we, and we can educate ourselves. What does that mean? Okay, now I understand what it means. This takes courage, but I'm afraid. So we know that fear can fuel your courage, that courage doesn't come without fear. They're like connected twins. So it's okay to be afraid, but maybe start practicing by standing up for a friend or someone you don't know, um, somebody who's being mistreated and, and then expanding it from there. So we ask people, students and young people, start small, just start small and practice yourself every day. Did I do the best I could today? Was I loving towards somebody who wasn't very lovable? <laughs> you know, did I show my best self? And think about that world that we could create if everybody just looked inward to themselves and said, did I do my best today? Was I my best self? Yeah. And that, I, that you know, tempts me to ask you one more dimension of this. But then what do we do when we know we have not been able to be our best self? And, you know, in different countries of the world today, people are facing this problem that when they are confronted by someone who is spewing hatred, who is very openly advocating um, either violence or some form of uh, discrimination against people they don't like, who think they are the others, it is very easy to hate the hater. Uh, or it is uh, not easy. Let me say, let me put it another way. There is a natural impulse that arises, you know, where you feel, oh, you know, I can't stand this person. So how do you deal with that? How do you overcome that feeling? Because I think uh, that, that that's a crucial point, right? Where right. 
we can make I, it or not. I spent the past four years living in a country led by somebody that could make you feel that way. And that's when you get challenged with your practice. And you say to yourself again, what must, what must not be right in that person's life to make them act and say the things that are being said and act the way that they're acting? Um, and that's kind of what kept me sane over the past four years was to think about um, knowing that there were so many people in this country that didn't feel that way and that people were working harder than ever to turn that, to turn that sadness into, um, and that hatred into something different. And I, I felt like maybe he was put here for a reason and it was to wake people up, to wake people up to the racism that exists in this country, the white supremacy, and to say enough is enough, and to start working to create a new possibility for everybody. So while, while a lot of people were, like you said, I hate him, I, you know, I didn't go to that place, I went to the place of hope. So principle six is the universe is on the side of justice. And when Dr. King said the universe, he meant God, but he also wrote that if you do not believe in God, there is some type of cosmic energy, cosmic force that is bending the moral arc of the universe towards justice. And that's what I kept thinking about. Beautiful. Is there any wish list you have for ways in which you would like to see this work you do supported or reaffirmed or you know, uh, uh, what kind of solidarities do you do you crave? Well, let's see. I I welcome any solidarity. Anybody who wants to learn about how to replicate this someplace else, I'd be happy to talk to. Um, we would like to train as many educators as we can. If there's a country where there's a collective group of people from a school, let's say, that is interested in training, we could, we could connect them with, with a virtual experience. Um, I think that the news, shamefully, that makes people think that this is a very violent world, but we know that that's not true, that they're only showing us part of what's happening. And the work that I do, that you do, that all the people you've been interviewing do, where is that on the national news? That needs to be, to be shared. And so I'm so glad that you're doing this because it's important for other people to see what the possibilities are. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robin, and wishing you all the best. Wishing Thank you. you Very best. nice to be here.